Our reading for today comes from Acts chapter 1. Now, something I want to note about this reading, Peter is going to recount uh, the story of Judas. And uh, just a note for parents, uh, might be a little graphic uh, for some of that, but uh, the, uh, Peter holds no stop backs in describing uh, the detail of this. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And uh, when they had entered, they went to the upper room where they were staying. Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus and Simon the Zealot and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120. And he said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in the ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out, that it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akeldama, that is, the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, May his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John on Till the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabbas, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, You, Lord, who know the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them. And the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. You know, we usually do have to make those hard decisions, don't we? And uh, I, that's why I absolutely love our text today, because we find a little bit of uh, guidance on that. And here are some words uh, to reflect on from that text, verse 14. It says, All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. Can you pray with me, please? May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, O Lord. Amen. I talked to the kids, and of course, you know, they've started to face, you know, times where they don't know what to do, and they know who to go to. And as we become adults, you know, we do have to make big decisions. Big decisions about careers. We have to make decisions about work. Maybe sometimes the decisions are tough because whatever choice we make, they affect other people, sometimes negatively. And it can be very hard to make those decisions. And any wise person knows that you don't make those decisions alone. You usually talk to others, right? And when I get to those points, I usually go to people I trust. I go to the people who have knowledge or some experience with the situation that I'm dealing with, and I look for their insight. Sometimes I go to my friends, you know, and they will, uh, they have some wisdom about, you know, whatever I'm talking about, maybe not, maybe it was a bad choice to go to them. Uh, sometimes I talk directly to the people who might be affected by the choice they make to get their insight. But I can tell you that much, most of the time when I'm dealing with something difficult, I go to my mom. I go to her and, and it's not always because she has the answer. Sometimes she does. It's not always because she knows what to do in that exact moment. It's because my mom knows me. In fact, she knows me in a way probably better than I know myself. And she can help me identify things, you know, that she can help me identify my frustration. She can also just be an ear to listen sometimes and give me encouragement. She can be there to help me just in those other respects. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate my mom who puts up with a lot with me, who has put up with so much for the last 32 years. And I just want to say, if you're a mom in here, can you stand up, please? Can you please stand up if you're a mom? Can we give moms a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. 
Happy Mother's Day. We don't know where we'd be without you. Just ask your husbands. It's true. Even if they won't admit it, it's true. So when we make hard decisions, uh, you know, we usually go to other people. And in so many instances, you know, I also wish that I would have the one person there who could always give me the right answer, and that'd be Jesus. I mean, how convenient would it be if Jesus were next to me, and I were able just to ask him as I ask other people for advice and for help? And if we go into the Bible, we find the disciples got a lot of that, and quite honestly, I'm pretty envious of it. I mean, in one instance, you have the disciples bickering among each other, saying, who is the greatest? So they walk up to Jesus and say, hey, Jesus, who's the greatest among us? And then in another instance, there's 5,000 plus people there, and Jesus looks at him and says, you give them something to eat, and they're holding a few loaves of bread and fish. And they look at him and say, wait a sec, Jesus, do you want us to go to the market and buy stuff? Or maybe Jesus shares a parable, and they're kind of looking at him headlong like this, and they say, Jesus, can you explain to us exactly what that meant? And he does. Sometimes he gives them a straight answer. Sometimes he just becomes the answer and fixes the problem. And it would be so nice if we had that too. But see, even the disciples, so they got three years of that, they also knew that it wouldn't be that way forever. In the very upper room that, are, that the events of our text are happening in, Jesus tells the disciples that he's going away. He's going back to his father to prepare a place for them. They know Jesus isn't going to be there forever. And now we come to that point in our text. Jesus has just ascended into heaven. Now, in the ascension account, we actually get a few of them in the Bible, and one of them, Jesus actually gives the disciples a final command. He looks at them and he says, wait. He says, I want you to wait in the city, in Jerusalem, until you are clothed with power from on high. Wait. That's his final recorded command before he ascends. And as they're kind of staring up blankly like this, all of a sudden two angels appear and they say, what are you staring at? This Jesus who just rose, he's going to come back the same way. He'll be back. So in that, just in that little account, we get, two, we get a few things. One, Jesus doesn't leave the disciples empty-handed when he goes. He tells them to wait. He doesn't tell them how long they're going to wait. It's only going to be 10 days. He doesn't tell them, though, it's only going to be 10 days. He just says, wait. But then he leaves them with some promises as they're waiting. He says, one, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't use those words, but you are going to receive my power so you can follow me to guide the church. But then he also gives the promise that he's coming again. It's so interesting to find the disciples' this predicament, because again, this is right before Pentecost. This is 10 days prior to, uh, to the events of that. All they knew is that they had to wait. And you know, when you're told to wait, you really don't know how long you're going to be waiting. It can get a little hard. And if we look at our life in the Christian church, I mean, just as our lives as Christians, I think there's a lot of crossover. We're waiting too. We're waiting for Jesus to come back as well. We are waiting for him to just to come back and destroy sin, death, and the power of the devil and to take us into his kingdom where we will be with him eternally. We're waiting for that. But he didn't tell us when he's coming back. So what do we do in the meantime? What do we do while we're waiting for Jesus, for those promises he's given us to be fulfilled? And I love our text um, for this reason, because our text gives us a little guidance on that. Our text uh, gives us a little insight as to how the disciples handled waiting. Now, mind you, the disciples were also a new church. I mean, this is the start of the Christian church. And I feel like here at Vine and Branches, I feel like we're on the cusp of a new chapter, a new beginning. So what can we glean from our text here today? So, our text begins, uh, the disciples are walking back from the hill of ascension, and they're, they're going into, uh, they're going back and meeting in the upper room. And it's really interesting. The text actually tells us what they do. You notice what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that they, uh, they went down, sat on the couch, pulled their iPhones out, and started playing Candy Crush. They didn't uh, all of a sudden turn on Netflix and start streaming their favorite shows. Well, Jesus said to wait, so we're just going to hang around and do nothing until, well, he does whatever. That's not what it says. That, that, that's not what waiting looks like. 
He said, waiting, well, there's actually things that are happening. Here are the words that it says what they began to do. It says all of these, we're talking about all of the people present there, it's about 120, with one accord, were devoting themselves to prayer. They devoted themselves to prayer. All of us have prayed. We all learned to pray probably when we were little from mom, dad, or grandma, grandpa, we learned to pray. And in that prayer, we all know who's on the other end of that. Jesus says, prayer is that conversation with God. Prayer is such an important thing. And I imagine, too, that Peter, now Peter was pretty well versed in the Old Testament, as was the apostles, and they were probably reading scripture in the meantime. And they did this because they knew when before Jesus left, he gave them a command. We talked about this two weeks ago, and with the vine and branches text, Jesus said, abide in my word. You see, Jesus left. He was gone. But they wanted to maintain that relationship that relationship with Christ. Jesus said, I will still be present with you, if not physical, and you will find me in the Word. You can talk to me in prayer. I'm still there. They wanted to maintain that relationship. But see, it's, it's not just maintaining a relationship. I actually like to think of it as a proactive approach to a relationship. You see, they're the ones initiating. They're the ones reaching out. They're the ones seeing what Jesus has to say. They're interested in Jesus. And I'll be honest, I found this a little convicting because I think of my relationship with my mom and there are times, you know, where my relationship with her has been anything but proactive. It's been very reactive. You know, when I talk to mom, when she calls me, <laughs> you know how this goes, right? Um, you know, when I call mom, when I need something, I'm in college. Mom, I need money. You know, I'm, uh, I'm home and maybe, uh, maybe I want to go out with friends. Back when I was in high school, you know, I'd ask for money. I could ask dad too. And, you know, mom, I need this. Mom, I need that. Or maybe then I'd reach out to mom, as I told you earlier, because something's hard in my life. And I just wanted to, you know, to vent and to, to, to kind of let everything out. But I really didn't care how she was doing. It was all about me. Mom was there for me. And when I look at the way that, you know, when I, when I look at the, the, the fruit of that and the results of that, you know, I realize that why am I talking to mom? Well, if it's all about me, I'm only doing it because I need something. Or maybe I, or maybe, you know, the thing is I do want to go to her, but I'm afraid to go to her because maybe mom asked me to do something that I really didn't want to do. And if I call her, she's going to remind me about it. And I really don't want to do it. Whatever it is, it could be anything. And so I kind of play the avoidance game, you know? Well, I talked about how this text was convicting because I think, you know, so often there are definitely times in my life where my relationship with Jesus has been very reactive. It's that moment when, you know, I, I would go to, to Jesus, but I'm only going to him because I'm hoping he'll give me something I want. I don't pray every day. I just go because, you know, something's going wrong in my life and I like God to fix it so it goes the way that I want it to go. But maybe I also don't want to go to God, but maybe I don't want to go to God at all because maybe there's something I read in the Bible or something I heard in a sermon that I really didn't want to hear because it challenges what I want to be true. So I avoid it. And I avoid it. It's that voice, and yet the Holy Spirit, of course, who's in us, keeps reminding us of whatever that thing is, and we keep kind of avoiding it and avoiding it and avoiding it, and you already know how that goes. In fact, I showed the kids what that looked like with my, well, not working Tom Tom GPS. You can keep going that way, and you can keep going that way, but the result is not going to probably get you where you want to be. Maybe it's just, it's probably, well, I wouldn't say maybe, it's probably destructive, Maybe God is calling us back into something else. And so when I look at what, uh, what Peter is doing here, well, I actually believe that Peter was called into a difficult moment in this time. You see, the disciples had a friend. His name was Judas. He was a friend for a while. They got to know him. They became close. He traveled with them. He, well, he was in charge of managing the money. He wasn't always honest about it. They didn't know it at the time. But they, he was a friend. And then he wasn't. He betrayed God. 
he betrayed them. And so they're probably wrestling with that grief. And I think we all know what that grief is. And, you know, as much as, you know, as, as great as moms are, you know, the truth is some of us might have a difficult relationship with mom too. It's not always pretty. Some of those close relationships are rough. Peter's wrestling with that. And what does he do? He doesn't just go to his friends and start complaining. He turns to God and he turns to scripture and God leads him to Psalm 109 verse 8. And that's actually what's quoted here. It says, let another take his office. The rest of Psalm 109 is there. May his camp become desolate. You know, we're talking about Judas here. And Peter believes that God wanted the church to do something about this, to, to do something about the hurt that he and the rest of the church is experiencing because of Judas. He said, you know, we're going to find someone to take his place. Now, scholars are kind of out on the, you know, they, they kind of debate, is this really the right move? Is there a significance to the number 12? Is there, did they really need to do that? Well, we can debate all day about that, but there's something here that's important because whether or not this was the right way to go, Peter believed that God was at work in this. So he went that direction and the church did too. They followed him and well, they did it by a thing called casting lots. It's this nice little thing where you can, uh, where maybe it's a jar, maybe a cup, and you draw straws. And well, the church did all the work in whittling down to two people they thought would make good apostles, but they didn't know the direction to go. We come back to direction. Now, the Bible does not teach that when you don't know what to do, cast lots. It's not a prescriptive kind of teaching that says this is how God's will is done. Rather, I think what the casting lots is teaching us is what we call surrender. So, like, God, we whittled it down to two people. We really don't know who is going to make, who's the right person for this. So we're going to trust your will in this. We are going to surrender this to you. So there's two things we're kind of playing with here. On the one hand, if you look at our relationship with Jesus, Maybe our relationship is really good right now. Maybe it's very proactive. Maybe it's something that we are prioritizing, that we are putting first. And we take a lot of time with God and his word personally, maybe in a Bible study group, uh, praying together, praying individually, and we're in a really healthy place with that. Maybe our relationship is not that. Maybe it's reactive. We go to God when we need him. We go to God because we feel like we have to. We go there because someone guilt us into it. You know, it's and we're not really getting all the fruit that God wants to give us. We're not receiving all the things that he wants to show us. And then we get to those difficult decisions and we really don't know what to do. What does your relationship look like right now? Maybe there is also something that God has put in front of you that is some hard text or hard belief or something on your heart that, uh, that he wants you to address with somebody. And what is keeping you from doing that? So that's one thing we're playing with here. The other side here is decision-making. You see, it's really cool, as I mentioned earlier, being in Vine and Branches. One of the things that got me so excited about being here was this new chapter, this new opportunity to look ahead, this new, these new ideas, this new direction we get to go. And I'll tell you, when we start to walk into some of those places, there's going to be a lot of right directions, but we can't do all the right directions. There's going to be some times where God's going to invite us to just trust him and we're going to pick one. There's going to be times where maybe the direction that, that I'm thinking of or you're thinking of, maybe God doesn't want us to do either of those. And God is inviting us to trust him with that and to surrender our feelings toward that. God is inviting us to trust. And so when I look at our ministry here, I am so excited and one of, and I may be excited because of all the, I'm excited also because of the new things that God's put in front of us, but I'm also excited to see what he is going to do because I know this is going to be an opportunity not only to grow this place, but to grow me, to grow you, to challenge you in new places. I look forward to seeing what that's going to look like. Because you know what? When I look at Jesus, even though I don't always, even though my re relationship can sometimes be reactive, 
Jesus is very proactive. He's proactive with me, even when I'm not. He's like my mom. She calls me way more than I call her when I probably should be calling her more. But she calls that. I'm, I will, and I got to call my grandma too. Thank you. But seriously, Jesus is proactive with me anyway, even though I don't deserve it. And he is proactive with you too. He cares about you. He knows what's going on in your life. He wants to hear about it from you though. He wants you to hear what he has to say because like our moms, he knows what's best for me. He knows what's best for you. He wants to hear from you. Now, the thing is, sometimes also we don't really know where to begin in God, reading God's word and prayer. And you know what? I'd love to talk about that with you. Or you know what? There are other people probably in your life who know how to do those things pretty well. It might even be mom and dad. You should ask them and see what that looks like. And I think what's going to be so fun in this ministry is we're going to look ahead. We're going to start to do a little more of that. We're going to start to dive more into that. And we're going to watch God grow us in a whole bunch of new ways that can be scary at first, but really satisfying really fulfilling in the end because Jesus isn't just proactive with you he's proactive with the church he's proactive with this place and we are all here today myself included because of what he did God is caring for this place he knows what it needs he knows where it's going and we can trust him and so we do until he comes again Amen. There's...